Welcome everyone to this uh, wonderful BMS meeting. Thank you for being ever so patient. I would like to say it was to build suspense, but unfortunately it was technical errors. I would like everyone to ask everyone if they could make sure their mics are muted and you can have your cameras on, but ideally if you could turn your cameras off. I hope you've got a lovely glass of wine or a cup of tea for what's going to be a very exciting talk with Professor Janet Quinn, who is the Deputy Dean of the Biosciences Institute at Newcastle University. She's also the newly elected president of the British Mycological Society, and most importantly, she is our speaker this evening. So without hesitation, I'll pass to Professor Janet Quinn, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Okay, sorry about that technical hitch. I don't know what went wrong there. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking um, Nathan Smith for his kind invitation to deliver this seminar, and also for his kind introduction. I'd like to start by saying that it is, you know, a real privilege to, to have this role as president of the British Mycological Society for the next two years. And I really look forward to working with you all to, con to continue the fantastic works that the society undertakes to promote fungal science, but also to inspire the future generations of mycologists. And I think one of the unique features of this society is that we have a broad interest in all areas of mycology and we bring together academics and field mycologists, you know, and just amateur mycologists who are just really interested in, in mycology. And so I thought tonight, rather than focus on my specific research interest in medical mycology, that it may actually be a broader interest um, to the membership to give you what will actually be a whirlwind tour of emerging fungal threats in three areas, and these are food security, wildlife diversity, and human health. And collectively, these threats are currently um, representing a clear and present danger to life on Earth. Okay, well, I know that I'm talking to the converted here when I extol how fabulously diverse our fungal kingdom is. So estimates suggest that the fungal kingdom comprises um, of around 5 million fungal species, which are fabulously diverse. And they range from these microscopic single cell yeasts, such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae as shown here, to filamentous fungi or moulds, such as the Aspergillus that I've shown here, to more, um, I'm just gonna move this out of the way, to more, macroscopic um, filamentous fungi which have these um, more developed rooting bodies as you can see here and I think perhaps an interesting fact is, is that you know although we have these microscopic um, fungal species as shown here the fungal kingdom is actually home to the largest living organism currently alive on the planet and that is this honey fungus which is actually 2.5 miles in diameter and you can find this within the Blue Mountains in Oregon, um, and it is the largest living organism on the planet as we speak. So as you know, fungi are absolutely everywhere. They're in the soil, they're in the air that we breathe. And I think one of the things that is really intriguing about, about fungi is their amazing resilience and their adaptability to environments, including extreme environments. So, we know that we can find you know fungi even in volcanoes we can find them at the antarctic and um, we can also um believed or not fungi have also actually been um found within the within the damaged radioactive um reactor at chernobyl so fungi are absolutely everywhere but i think i would be doing the fungal kingdom a disservice if i did not um, mentioned at the outset that fungal pathogens only represent a handful of the fungal kingdom and fungi are actually vital for life. They provide essential roles as degraders of organic matter as you can see here. So they, de they degrade organic matter from dead animals and plants, recycling these and then releasing them back into the environment. And I think, you know, it, it, this, you know, without this, then actually the planet would not exist as we know it. And I think within tropical rainforests, then fungi actually are responsible for 50% of the recycling of all of the vegetable, plant um, and animal, you know, um, 
matter within that environment. In addition, fungi also play an essential role as, as mycorrhiza and plant growth. So mycorrhiza fungi are intimately associated with the roots of plants. And whilst the fungi benefit from this relationship by getting photosynthetic carbohydrates from the plant, what the fungi does is it actually makes available nutrients and water for the plants, which is essential for their health and well-being. And I think, you know, between 70 and 80 percent of plants are actually associated with these mycorrhiza fungi. So fungi are essential for life. They play a vital role within our ecosystems. And we also use fungi in our everyday lives. So for example, you know, the, the baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is used to make beer and wine and bread, which are three of life's essentials, according to many people, including myself. And on top of that, we also have um, filamentous fungi, such as this penicillium here, which is widely used in, in cheese making and food production. And also fungi also generate a large amount of secondary metabolites, which are often used for medicines and perhaps the most widely you know, known medicine is the antibiotic penicill penicillin that comes from filamentous fungi. We also use products from, from fungi in a whole range of industrial applications. And we also use fungi as, as um, is a biocontrol, um, for example, in the control of insects. So we use fungi every day in our lives. Um, it gives us massive benefits. But what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is a darker side of our fungal kingdom. And these are killer fungi that infect plants, animals and humans and they're currently presenting a clear and present danger to life on Earth. So there are a handful of pathogens that are infecting our crops, which are causing a massive um, impact on our food security. More recently, fungal species are emerging that are driving animal species to extinction. And as humans, we're not exempt from the danger of these fungal forts. And in fact, we're more um, at risk of fungal infections than ever before. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to showcase some of the major fungal pathogens um, that, are, that we know about that infect plants and animals and humans, just to illustrate how they are presenting a clear and present danger to life on Earth. So starting with the plant fungal pathogens. So the challenge that we have here is that with the growing pop world population is that we need to be able to sustainably feed over 9 billion people by 2050. And this requires a significant increase in food production. The problem that we are faced with is that there are a number of biotic threats, including bacteria, viruses and fungi that cause a major problem to food security and that we lose up to 30% of all crops produced by um, these biotic threats. And of these biotic threats, then fungi are the major problem and they can result in crop losses um, of 20%. So that's 20% of all crops grown that feed the world population um, are lost due to the action of these fungal pathogens. So these present a major threat to our international food security. So fungal pathogens that affect wheat have been around for centuries. So they've been around for as long as records begin. Now, as far back as we can go, we have evidence of, of, of fungal um, species actually causing famines um, and devastation throughout history. 
But what is alarming is that there is an increasing number of fungal pathogens um, found to infect our crops across the world. So this video that I'll play in a moment, what this shows is it demonstrates the increasing number of fungal pathogens that have been identified across the, across the globe over a 50 year um, period. And, if, and so this number here, this basically, or this, this color chart actually reflects the number of fungal species that infect plants that have been identified in these various locations. So I'll just start the video. And hopefully you can see that over time, we're seeing an increase in the coloration across all of these different continents across the globe. And it's getting greater and greater. So this is a major challenge. And this major challenge is actually compounded by a further meta-analysis of the available data, which has shown that due to climate change, it would appear that plant pathogenic fungi are actually on the move. And this is at an alarming rate of eight kilometers a year. So fungal pathogens are moving into areas that they know that, that they have not um, existed before. And this is clearly going to provide a future challenge um, for food security. So if we look at the um, plant fungal pathogens, what I've shown here, these are the five crops that are the most valuable with regard to food production. So these are the five most valuable calorie crops. And these include white, sorry, white. These include wheat, rice, um, corn, potatoes, and soybeans. And these, because these are the major, major calorie crops, with these three actually, with the wheat, rice, and corn actually um, covering 40% of all agricultural land, then you might anticipate that the most important fungal pathogens when it comes to food security are those that impact on these crops. So these are the five fungal pathogens that I've shown here that impact on these crops causing wheat stem rust, rice blast, maize smut, potato blight, and soybean rust. And as I've alluded to already, you know, these, these infections, they're not new, as I'm sure most of you know that the potato blight was responsible for the potato famine um, within Ireland in um, the 1840s. And not only did this cause the deaths of a million Irish people, it also forced the max, mass exodus of two million um, people from this country at that time. So these pathogens have been around for considerable time. So if we then just look at the impact of these pathogens on crop losses, what I'm showing here is the percentage crop losses attributed to each of these pathogens and what impact this has on food loss um, every annum. And they, this is based on basically the world harvest statistics. So you can see here the percentage crop losses are significant for all five of these pathogens. There's a huge amount of variability and that's because variation occurs depending upon the location you know, of the actual infection. But despite this, you can see that this has a significant impact on food losses. When you consider how many millions of people that these losses could feed every year. So what does this mean in real terms? So Professor Serega, who is a member of our society and she's also a chair of food security at Exeter University, has said that, has been quoted as saying that even low level persistent disease leads to losses that if we could prevent it would be sufficient to, to feed almost 10% of the world population. And what she also goes on to say is that if we did have severe epidemics in all of the five main calorie crops that I've just shown you, 
then basically we would just have enough food to feed only 40% of the world population. <clears throat> she does go on to reassure us that the probability of this happen happening is very low, but I think it is worrying and if you excuse the pun, it gives us food for thought. <clears throat> so how can we mitigate the damage caused by these fungal pathogens and how can we how can we aim to sustainably feed the world population both now and in the future? Well I think it's important to note that um, that some of the challenges that we're facing have actually been enforced by modern agricultural practices. For example, um, planting huge areas of, of agricultural land with genetically identical crops that maybe carry only one or two inbred resistance genes. And then on top of that, we will use um, a single type of fungicide. And these two contributory factors, what they actually do is that they drive, um, they, they drive the presence of, of virulent um, fungi which are actually resistant to the antifungals. So this can be mitigated by, um, by planting varieties of, of crops or not planting monocultures and actually using a rotational use of fungicides or, or combinations of fungicides to prevent the emergence of these virulent and drug resistant strains that are becoming also commonplace um, these days. And then on top of this, we also need to be able to better detect um, the disease causing pathogens. And I have an example here that, that shows how beneficial it can be if, this can, if, if such disease causing pathogens can be rapidly um, detected. So in 2016, there was um, a new fungal disease found that was colonizing wheat fields in Bangladesh. And this covered 15,000 hectares um, of wheat fields. And the disease was characterized by these um, bleached and dead spikes on the wheat plants. So essentially, a group of scientists was mobilized and within weeks, they performed transcript profiling of, um, of the pathogen infected leaves on the wheat plants. And this together with phylogenetic analysis actually accurately pinpointed the fungus to this wheat infecting South American lineage of the blast fungus Magnaporthe oseii. So it seemed as if this fungus came from South America. And actually this was backed up by a report showing that so-called rotten wheat had been actually imported into Bangladesh from Brazil in um, 2016 or 2015, sorry. And actually this same fungus was identified in Brazil in 1985. So it seems as if the trans, you know, this fungus was actually transmitted from Brazil to Bangladesh in 2016 with devastating consequences. However, the actual identity of this fungus has now allowed for an, you know, an informed approach as to how we can actually deal with this epidemic in Bangladesh. And that involves using disease resistant cultivars from South America and also using the antifungal regimes that are known to work against this um, a particular fungal pathogen. In addition to, to these areas, it's also clear that we need much more fundamental um, research to understand the strategies that are used by these plant inf infecting pathogens. What, what strategies are they using to infect and colonize the host? And by understanding this, this will help us to engineer disease resistant plants, 
but it will also help drive forward the development of better antifungals. And speaking of antifungals, so the current strategy at the moment is to actually spray crops with these chemicals that act against the fungus, which has significant impacts on the ecosystem. And actually also, as, you, as I'll show you um, later on, it also impacts on animal and human health. So really what we need is we need to design more eco-friendly antifungals. And there has been some exciting advances in this field. So scientists have recently shown that if you spray plants with RNA that targets essential genes within the fungus, this can actually prevent the fungus from infecting the plant. And you see a reduction, you see a significant increase in crop protection. So this new technology that's been developed is called spray-induced gene silencing. And because this has minimal impact on the ecosystem, it's considered to be environmentally friendly. And so this eco-friendly fungicide approach is actually giving us some promise um, for the future treatment of these um, plant infecting fungal killers. Okay, so, so whilst I think it's fair to say that we have been plagued with plant killing fungal pathogens for a very long time, the actual um, until recently, there has been no real significant threat against animal wildlife by such fungal pathogens. But this has changed recently um, through the identification of fungal disease that is driving the extinction of certain animal species. And this is caused by fungal pathogens that were previously unrecognized. So the first example of these emerging animal fungal pathogens that I'm going to talk about is a fungal disease that causes white nose syndrome. And this is a bat disease that was first seen in New York State in 2006. So what happened is that during a standard um, census of bats hibernating within the state in 2006, Six, they came across a huge amount of, of uh, mortality. So a large amount of bats were actually dead um, in these areas. And what, how these animals were characterized is that they had this, they, they seem to be infected by the striking fungus that causes this white muzzle here. And it also infected the wings. But this white muzzle here coined the term white nose syndrome. And it's now known that this is caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans, and please excuse my pronunciation, but it's called PD for short, thankfully. And this is a core living fungus that can only infect bats during hibernation. It wouldn't be able to affect bats, you know, when they're their normal temperature of 37, but hibernating bats have a, an average core temperature of seven degrees, and this is perfect for this fungus. This here we can just see a micrograph of the fungus, which shows the spores and the filaments of PD. And here we have an electron micrograph showing PD actually adhering to the hairs of the bat. And it's now known that this fungal skin infection caused by PD is actually causing chronic respiratory acidosis and electrolyte imbalance. And what this actually does is that it disrupts the hibernation um, of the bat. So the bat wakes up and unfortunately this, this ending of the hibernation depletes the energy reserves of the bat, which are essential for it to overwinter. And actually what you often see um, in bats that have this white nose syndrome 
is that you can see them flying um, outside in the daylight um, in the winter outside of their winter habitats. So what is alarming about this particular fungus is that is, is its rapid spread again. And basically it has spread to nearly all of the bat winter shelters um, that are monitored within the Eastern United States and Canada. It's been estimated that over 7 million bats have actually died from this fungal disease. And as I'm sure most of you know, bats are insect eating animals. And the Forestry Service in America have estimated that because of this decimation in the bat population, that there's 2.4 million extra pounds worth of insects that have not been consumed, which of course is having significant impacts on the ecosystems there. And what is really devastating is that several species of the brown bat within the United States um, are threatened with extinction including this once plentiful um, little brown bat. And there's no estimate saying that, you know, there's a 99% chance that this bat will be extinct in the next few years. So how has this happened? You know, how, where has this fungus come from? So again, sequencing, you know, of the fungus and the phylo uh, genomic analysis has revealed that this fungus is identical to a fungus that commonly resides in Europe. So it's known that bats do not migrate between these two continents. And so it's currently believed that human activity is again responsible for the spread of this fungal pathogen. Evidence in support of this comes from the fact that, that the actual identification of bats with the white nose syndrome in America often occurs within habitats that are without the flying range of the bats. So that's further evidence. And also the cave in which this was first identified, the white nose syndrome, is a popular tourist destination in New York State. And so it's currently believed that tourists are carrying this fungus into these habitats, either on their claws or on their caving equipment. And it's this that has caused the spread of this fungus so quickly. So some good news, if there is any good news, is that in a recent headline, it was found that Asian bats show resistance to this deadly white nose syndrome. And this is, of course, true for the European bats. And so I think what it's fair to say that, that you know, that this, the fungus, the PD fungus and the Europe, European bats have coexisted for millions of years and they have co-evolved together. So the fungus is no longer, is, is not a threat to this particular bat population. And the same is true for the bats in Asia. However, you know, the, the, you know, the actual introduction of this fungus into the naive North American bat population who have never seen this fungus before is what's responsible for this absolute decimation of the bat population. <clears throat> so then moving on to a second example, there's also been a further fungal disease called chytridiomycosis, which is actually a fungal disease which has been attributed as causing the greatest disease-driven loss of biodiversity that has ever been documented. And this disease is caused by this skin-infecting amphibian fungus, which is called, and again, excuse the pronunciation, Batrichochytrium dendrobaditis, which was discovered in 1997. And this again, fortunately is shortened to VD. 
It's been shown that this fungus can infect over 500 species of, of amphibians in 54 countries. So that's across all continents where amphibians are found and it's highly pathogenic. It's contributed to a loss of about 6% of the world's amphibian population. And actually this has resulted in the extinction of 90 different species. And some areas of Central America have lost over 40% of their amphibian species. So it's because of this, this, is, this fungus is attributed to the greatest loss of biodiversity. So this fungus BD, it's a, it, it's a, it's a water dwelling fungus um, where it exists in the water as these motile zoospores. So they swim in the water and upon finding a frog or whatever amphibian, it can actually penetrate the skin using secreted enzymes that are highly destructive. And it, then it forms the zoosporangium. The zoosporangium grow and they actually cause a, a, an extensive systemic infection of the frog within its skin. And the skin is absolutely essential for the frog's viability. And so once the fungal infection has taken hold, then the frog loses its ability to regulate electrolytes. And this actually ultimately leads to the amphibian having a cardiac arrest. So this is what's driving the death of so many amphibians. So where did this come from? You know, why, why did this happen? And I'm pleased to say that yet again, another member of, of our society, Professor Matt Fisher and his team at Imperial College actually uncovered the origins of this amphibian killing fungus of BD and it even made the BBC headlines. And using, um, using sequencing, using the phylogenomic approaches, they identified the origin of this fungus to be within um, to be within Asia, within this South Korean peninsula. And actually they can pinpoint the fungus to a particularly um, hypervirulent strain, which they call this panzootic lineage or BDGPL. So how is this fungus spread across the world? Well, research from Professor Fisher and his team have also revealed that animal trade is one of the main reasons that this fungus is actually um, spread across the globe. And there is very little um, biocontrol systems in place at borders, and there is no control on, on actually trading um, amphibian species as pets or as food sources or for other reasons. And so this has led Matt to, to actually say that until the ongoing trade in infected amphibians is halted, we will continue to put our irreplaceable global amphibian biodiversity recklessly at risk. And so he's calling for bans on, on the trade of these animals um, and much better control of borders to allow for any sort of infections to be identified and contained. And this is really important because it's very difficult to control this infection now that it is so widely and diversely spread across the globe. Okay, so this brings me to the human um, fungal killers and I think it's, it's fair for me to say that, that most of us are well aware that fungi cause skin infections. So we're all aware of athlete's foot and ringworm and these types of fungal infections, skin, inf skin fungal infections cause over a million, uh, billion cases um, every year. And fungi can actually also colonize, uh, colonize the internal linings um, of various cavities within our body. These are called mucosal infections, and these are responsible for around about 100 million cases 
um, every year. The most commonly um, mucosal infection is called thrush, and this is an oral thrush um, infection, as you can see here. But also 75% of women throughout the world will experience at least one episode of vaginal thrush in their lifetime. So these infections are extremely widespread, but the good news is, is that they're not non-life-threatening, they're readily treatable with over-the-counter antifungals. But I think what is less appreciated is the cost to human life caused by human fungal infections and that 1.5 million people die every year due to systemic fungal disease. So this is more than what we see with breast cancer and malaria and about the same as what is documented with HIV and tuberculosis. But whilst we recognise these as really serious infectious diseases, I think it's fair to say that the threat to life by human fungal pathogens goes largely unrecognised. And it's because of this, these infections have sometimes been called hidden killers. So what are our main fungal fours? Well, I've shown three main fungal enemies here. <coughs> These include Candida albicans. So this is the fungal pathogen that my lab researches. And this can switch between yeast and hyphal forms, which is a really important virulence trait of this fungal pathogen. And this causes around about 300 deaths every year. And then secondly, we have Cryptococcus neoformans. Now this is an interesting fungus in that it's characterized, it's, it's often called the, the sugar coated killer because it's characterized by this, this extensive sugar capsule, which you can see here, which surrounds the fungus. And this causes around 650,000 deaths every year. And then finally, we have the filamentous fungus Aspergillus fumigatus, which has been attributed to over a million deaths every year. So before I alarm you too much, I need to say that these infections are only life-threatening in humans who have weakened immune systems. And in fact, systemic fungal infections to humans were relatively rare until probably the 1950s, which saw the introduction of immunosuppressive corticosteroid treatments. And that's when we saw the first um, systemic fungal infections. But what's important to note here is that we have an increasing number of immunocompromised people within the world's population now. And this is due to medicine, so um, more use of immunosuppressive therapies, for example, following organ transplantation or during cancer chemotherapy. Both of these treatments require severe immunosuppression. And also we have the HIV AIDS um, infection, which also results in people who are immunocompromised. And what is alarming and unacceptable fact is that around half the patients that succumb to an invasive fungal infection will actually die from that infection. So let's just look at these fungal infect, these uh, killer fungi in turn. So they all cause disease in different ways. So if we start with cryptococcus, this causes cryptococcal meningitis. Now this is a fungus found in the wild, so it's mainly found in the soil and it's associated with, with pigeon droppings, with bird excreta, and it releases spores. So we breathe in spores of cryptococcus neoformans every day where it's inhaled into the lungs. And normally, you know, because of our fabulous immune systems, we can clear this fungus and it causes us no damage. But if our immune condition and our immune system is suppressed, then this fungus can lodge within the lung alveoli and from which it moves into the central, central nervous system, into the brain where it can proliferate. And this is actually showing um, the brain section where you can see um, masses, fungal masses, which are caused by cryptococcus neoformans. So this fungus causes infection of the brain, cryptococcal meningitis. 
And this is a leading cause of death in HIV AIDS patients in sub-Saharan Africa. There's over a million cases reported every year and around 600,000 deaths are attributed to infections in this area. If we then move on to Aspergillus fumigatus, so this causes chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. And if we looked at fumigatus under the microscope, we would see these beautiful fruiting bodies, as we can see here, which release hundreds of spores. And we breathe in hundreds of these canidia of these spores every day. Um, Aspergillus is found you know, within the soil, it's found in the countryside, it's just absolutely everywhere. So we're breathing in thousands of Aspergillus spores every day. Again, if you're immunocompetent, it's not a problem, but if you are immunocompromised, then basically these spores can start to germinate within the lung. Um, you can get excessive filamentation, as you can see here, and this results ultimately in these huge masses of aspergillus um, within the lung, which then causes your chronic um, pulmonary aspergillosis. I think what's worth mentioning here is that a real problem with this um, infection is the alarming rise of isolates that are resistant to one of the main antifungals that we use to treat fungal infections, the azole antifungals. And it turns out that this evolution of antifungal drug resistance in this human fungal pathogen is being attributed to the widespread use of azole-based fungicides in agriculture. So we're using the same antifungal to treat crops, that's then driving antifungal resistance in the environment which is then causing a problem in treating patients that are infected with the same fungus. Okay, so then moving on to Candida albicans. So this fungus is different in that it's not an environmental fungus and it actually is a normal part of the human body. So most of us are actually colonized by Candida albicans and we can find it within our within our oral cavity in our mouth and also within the gut and it's part of our healthy microbiome so our healthy micro uh, microbe community that exists in these locations and you know in healthy patients you know this can sometimes um, overgrow these cavities where it resides causing these superficial infections called thrush which I had mentioned earlier but it becomes life-threatening in patients who remain immunocompromised. And in those patients, the fungus can actually leave the gut and enter the bloodstream. And once it's in the bloodstream, it can basically disseminate um, throughout the body and, con and colonize a whole host of different tissues, such as the kidneys as shown here. So just to give you a bit of a local perspective on this, in 2011, Public Health England reported 700 deaths in England and Wales due to cancer infections. And this is significantly more than that reported by one of the so-called superbugs that you may read about in the newspaper, the multidrug resistant Staphoris. So this fungal pathogen is actually causing more deaths than this bacterial infection. But I think it's fair to say we hear significantly less about this. Um, in our daily lives. So one of the things that, that fascinates my research group is the amazing ability, adapt adaptability of this fungus to actually colonize just about every single anatomical niche within the human host. So it can cause skin infections, as I've already said, it lifts within in our gastrointestinal urogenital tracts, it lives within our oral cavity, it can pretty much colonize every single organ in the body, including the brain. So what attributes does it have that allow this fungus to do this? Probably the most hostile environment that a fungus or any microbe will encounter in the human host are its innate 
immune system. So the white blood cells such as macrophages. So these provide us with the first line of defense against infecting microbes. So what happens is that the microbes such as a fungus will actually be engulfed by the macrophage. It's then taken up into these um, phagosomes, which are these organelles, which then throw a whole slew of toxic chemicals and reagents to the microbe to actually kill the pathogen and prevent the disease spreading. So how does candida albicans evade these, these defenses that our, that our body uses to kill pathogens? Well, the, the fungus has also got an extra trick up its sleeve and that it is a shape-shifting fungus. And as I've already mentioned, it can change between a budding yeast form to a more hyphal filamentous form. And what we know is that the fungus can actually be taken up into the macrophage as a budding yeast form, but it changes shape once it's inside the macrophage. And what I want to do now is I want to show you a video that shows the, what happens when the macrophage encounters this fungal pathogen. So this video was provided by Dr. Jude Bain from the Aberdeen Fungal Group. And what we have here is we have these candida um, fungal cells here. You can see these small cells dotted around. And here we have the macrophages, which are the larger cells here. Most of them are actually embedded um, or bound to the plate, whereas we have a few free floating macrophages. If you just look at what happens to these cells here when I start the video. So you can see that these cells have been taken into the macrophage and they're changing shape. And you can see that they're forming this extensive network of filaments. So what does this do? This actually pierces the macrophage membrane. So this kills the macrophage and it allows the pathogen to escape. So from a pathogen point of view, this is a really, you know, neat mechanism to evade immune killing um, by the fungal cell. But what we're interested in is how can the fungal cell actually survive within this hostile environment to, you know, to then allow it to form hyphae and to allow it to escape this environment? Because as I've already alluded to, you know, the white blood cell is a really hostile environment. So once the candida ends up inside the white blood cell, it's subjected to all of these different chemicals, um, toxic chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide, um, bleach-like chemicals. It's also um, battered with, with toxic heavy metals, digestive enzymes, antimicrobial peptides that actually affect the fungal cell wall. And this all happens within an environment that's highly acidic. So it's a really, really hostile environment. So, so what my lab are interested in are, this, are the proteins that the fungus has that allows it to survive in this hostile environment. As you might imagine, there are many processes that the fungus uses to survive within the phagosome. And one of the important proteins that we study on is called HOG1. And this is really, you can see this as like a, it's almost like this, the central crossroads of the fungal stress response. It's a central mediator of stress responses. So in response to a whole range of different stresses that the fungus will, will see all these different toxic um, assaults, the HOG1 protein becomes activated. And this activated protein then tells the fungal cell what it needs to do to actually survive the stress. So it is a real central protein in fungal stress responses. And this bar chart here is just showing that, that if I can see my mouse, I seem to have lost my mouse. So I hope you can see that the bar chart on the bottom right, or well, here it is, is showing that if we incubate wild type candida albicans cells with macrophages, then the candida cells survive very well. But if we remove the HOG1 protein from the candida cell, then we've significantly affected the ability of the, of the candida cell to survive in the macrophage. 
And I think what's also important to note is that these HOG1 proteins, they're found in all fungi and in every case examined, they've been found to be important for the virulence of that fungal pathogen. So HOG1 proteins are also important for virulence in plant infecting pathogens as shown here, insect infecting pathogens, and also in the three main um, human fungal pathogens shown here. So one of the areas that my lab is currently working on is trying to um, identify compounds that actually prevent the HOG1 protein functioning in fungi. We know that if we can do that, the fungi will no longer be able to cause disease. And because HOG1 is a global mediator of fungal virulence, we hope that by, um, by identifying such compounds, we'll be able to generate antifungals that could actually be broad acting and cross over between animal and plant infecting pathogens. So just to finish off, I just thought I would um, briefly mention a new human fungal pathogen. So this is an emerging um, human fungal pathogen, which is called Candida auris. So this fungus was initially identified in 2009 um, in a Japanese patient. Since then, it has emerged over five different continents. So it's gone from being in Japan to now being just about everywhere throughout the world. It's associated with high mortality rates, but what is really alarming is that some isolates of this fungal pathogen are resistant to all of the classes of antifungal drugs that are used to treat systemic infections, which means that these infections are actually untreatable. What's also cause for concern is that this fungus can actually be transmitted between hospital patients, and that's not the case from the fungal pathogens that I've mentioned earlier. So it does have an alarming set of attributes. And this actually made the BBC News again um, where it was reported in 2017 that this Japanese fungus, Canada auris, is spreading in UK hospitals. And actually the largest outbreak of this fungal pathogen, Canada auris, has occurred within um, a London hospital where there were 50 cases actually identified. So yes, so this fungus is drug resistant, it can be transmitted between patients and it can cause outbreaks. So definitely cause for concern. So my lab have made a small contribution to, to the fight in understanding this fungal pathogen and that we found that the HOG1 protein that I've mentioned earlier also regulates stress tolerance and virulence in this emerging pathogen. So what we hope is that compounds that actually target the HOG1 protein will also be effective against these antifungal resistant emerging fungal pathogens, such as Candida auris. <clears throat> so without doubt, one of the most enigmatic characteristics of Candida auris is that it has simultaneously emerged across different continents within the world. And it's clear that this emergence is not due to transmission of a single isolate like we've seen with some of the other fungal pathogens I've seen, because when these, um, when these isolates are sequenced, it can be seen that, that they are genetically distinct. So we have different genetic clades, um, sorry, geographical clades of this fungus spread across the world. So how what, what has driven the simultaneous emergence of this fungus across these different continents? It's just not known, but I just thought I would draw your attention to a recent hypothesis um, opinion article that was published very recently um, by Arturo Casa de Vale, who has indicated that climate change may be, um, may be responsible for the simultaneous emergence of this fungal pathogen. So what 
he is proposing is that we have global warming and then Candida auris, which previously existed as a plant saprophyte, has gained thermal tolerance because it's exposed to higher temperatures. Fungi are very adept at adapting to any change in its environment. And because of this, um, it, it has acquired this um, thermal tolerance, which then allows it to be transplanted um, and carried maybe by, by birds. I mean, this is really not known, but somehow Candida aura seems to have managed to find its way into environments, rural environments, which have then resulted in it actually ending up in urban environments. And there is some evidence to support the suggestion that climate change may be, may be involved in that in this study, what they also did is they looked at how thermotolerant Candida auris was, and they found that it was much able to withstand human body temperatures and higher compared to very closely related um, fungal relatives. So the question is, is this a recent emergence? And if so, has it been climate change that's driving that? This also raises a question of whether humanity are going to face new diseases due to fungal adaptation to hotter climates. So, although fungal pathogens are causing, human fungal pathogens are causing one and a half million deaths every year, it's fair to say that, you know, investment into studying um, this infectious agent has lagged way behind that of viruses and, and bacterial pathogens. However, there has been um, a unified effort from medical mycologists. And what's quite nice to report is that actually the voice of medical mycologists, you know, emphasizing the importance of human fungal infections is being heard you know, by eminent um, journals, by, um, by grant awarding bodies. Um, and, and I think that what I just wanted to tell you about now was it was a recent grant success that was funded by the Wellcome Trust. This was a Wellcome Trust strategic award to study medical mycology and fungal immunology. And this was led by Professor Neil Gow, who I think is in the audience tonight. And he, is, he was actually a former president of the British, British Mycological Society. And Professor Neil Gow led this award, which included a consortium of 11 different um, research institutes within the UK with a unique objective to provide a training um, environment for the next generation of mycologists. And this fabulous investment allowed us to address these three key areas that require immediate attention. So we need to have a much better and more rapid diagnosis of fungal infections in patients. And it is delays in diagnosis that are, that, that are attributable to the really high death rates that we see. We also need safe and more effective drugs. There are only three to four drugs that are licensed for systemic infections and they're all associated with, with side effects. And as I've alluded to already, resistance to these antifungals such as azoles is becoming a real problem, as is the emergence of these drug resistance um, pathogens. And also we need a better understanding of the biology of the fungus that allows these pathogens to cause disease so we can then inform um, you know better treatments better diagnosis with the ultimate goal to actually reduce the number of patients that are dying from fungal infections every year so to conclude then what i would like to say is that it's clear that that although fungi have wreaked havoc with our harvests through the centuries, what we're seeing now is we're seeing an unprecedented increase in plant infecting fungi. 
In addition, we're also witnessing an unprecedented and worldwide emer emergence of fungal pathogens that are attacking animal diversity. And we're also seeing significant increases in life-threatening human fungal infections. So these are all increasing. So why is this? And I hope that it's come across in this talk is that it's clear that in undisturbed ecosystems, more such negative interactions between the fungus and the host would be limited due to their core evolution. And actually the sentiment also rings true when we consider the current COVID-19 pandemic that we find ourselves in. But focusing on fungi, what I hope to have um, highlighted in this talk is how you know, human activity, climate change, and modest, modern medicine are all contributory factors to this unprecedented increase in these human, animal, and plant infecting fungi. So for example, we've shown how animal activity has driven the spread of BD, which has led to the amphibian decline. We've shown, I've shown you how climate change is, has been attributed to an increase in plant infecting fungal pathogens and also how the use of immunosuppressants, immunosuppressive therapies is also driving an increase in human infecting um, pathogens. So it's clear that we need a coordinated research effort to address these current challenges um, currently posed by pathogenic fungi. And this needs you know, a much greater understanding um, so it needs the research community co to come together to understand how these pathogenic fungi emerge, evolve and spread, how they adapt and survive in host environments and how they develop antifungal resistance. And it's only by addressing these current challenges that exist that we will be able to drive forward novel strategies to stop fungal disease. And this is more important you know, now than ever to mitigate the devastating impacts of fungal pathogens on life on earth and that's all I have for you so I hope you've enjoyed it oh, fantastic thank you ever so much I'm sure you'll all join me in giving a big virtual round of applause to Professor Jenna <laughs> Quinn for what is a talk that was both brilliant timely and perhaps a little bit terrifying <laughs> we have some time for questions I believe if, if that's the case um, so if you would like to put your questions into the chat and I will try and get through as many as possible. Um, we have one from during the chat, which I think is we're all quite desperate to hear the answer to from Paul Francis, who asks, is there anything we can do or consume to avoid Candida auris? I, well, I think that surveillance measures are in place. So, you know, that's, that, is, um, that is one good thing. I also um, feel that, you know, Candida auris will only cause um, you serious disease if you are seriously immunocompromised. So please try not to lose too much sleep. As we've got one, we've got uh, Professor Neil Gow, who's indeed in the audience, who asks, what will be your ambition for the BMS to help the challenge to deal with killer fungi? Okay, oh, that's a great question, Neil. Well, I think awareness, it has to be awareness. We have to raise awareness of these fungal falls, you know, across, you know, so many different, um, so many different parts of our community and stakeholders. What I am quite um, delighted to announce is that we have just appointed um, an outreach and engagement officer within the BMS, and I'm hoping that she will help us drive forward this aim to actually raise awareness of, of, of our fungal force so that they attract the attention that they need, you know, from the funding bodies, but also, you know, from, um, you know, from, um, pharmaceutical companies again I think that's a, a, a struggle that we that we have um, but a whole range of different sectors across the community. 
fantastic. So I'm, I suppose, is there the possibility that fungi could be part of the solution? <laughs> well, yes, they could be. Um, you can, um, so you can influence the composition of your of your gut microbiota, for example, um, with, you know, with um, with less pathogenic fungi, possibly through diet. Um, I'm not sure that there's been any, any, um, but Neil will probably be able to correct me whether there's any um, evidence of fungi killing fungi, there may be. In fact, actually, there, there, there are. So yes, possibly, possibly that could be a, a solution. Um, what we're actually working on at the moment um, is a different line of research in my lab is we're actually working on a bacterial secretion system that actually secretes proteins that kill fungi. And so, you know, one of our aspirations is to ask whether we can actually use these bacteria as an antifungal defense mechanism. So it could be that other microbes could be part of the solution. Fantastic. We've just got a question from Alistair Brown, um, who asks, uh, do mycorrhizae contain hog one? And if so, do you think you could stop your anti hog one drug killing off good fungi? Oh. I will say that they they will have hog one because I haven't come across a fungus that hasn't. Um, I think we would have to be very careful in treating plant fungal pathogens because of that, if that was the case, unless we could target them specifically to different types of fungi. Fantastic. We've, we've got a question from Claire Blanco who asks, do you think that in relation to emerging fungal plant pathogens for example, vigilance and recording by the BMS Fungus Recording Network, ne Network can be helpful in detecting outbreaks and spread. Do you know, Claire, that is a really excellent question. Um, this is not my research area, but I could actually find out if that would be a useful um, activity. And if it is, I can feed that back to you. Fantastic. I'm sure you can uh, be in touch. We have a question from Andy Bailey, who says resistance to antibiotics has had lots of news coverage. Is there any reason why resistance to antifungals has been largely ignored in the news? I can't think of any good reason why it has been largely ignored in the news, but probably for the same reason that, you know, that fungi don't seem to attract the attention that, that certain bacteria do, for example. Um, and, you, you know, you, you you hear about antimicrobial resistance all the time where people are talking about bacteria generating resistance to um, antibiotics. It is equally an important problem um, with fungi that are either emerging that are actually antifungal resistant, such as Candida auris, or fungi is so adept, their genomes are so adaptable that they can actually evolve antifungal resistance during treatment within the human host. So they are that adaptable and it is, a, it is a real problem in the available treatment strategies that we have to treat these killer pathogens. Fantastic. We've just got um, a note here from Derek Hargreaves who mentions that emerging fungal diseases should be reported to death for plant health officers. Um, for those here from the recording network community. There was a question earlier from Mariko Parslow who asks, I'm just scrolling through all the people who said thank you ever so much for your talk. There's so many. But Mariko Pazzo asked, are SIGS, are SIGs widely used commercially? If so, can you give some examples? Right. OK, well, this is not my area of expertise, but I did take a note of because I think this is this is fascinating new biology um, that, that is being exploited to treat um, fungal pathogens and if you just bear with me, I know that it's been used to treat fusarium species. Um, it's also been used to treat, um, so fusarium infecting barley. It's also been used to treat uh, botrytis infecting, um, I think, 
fruit um, and I don't know that but there's a there are a growing number of examples where this this new technology is being used to confer crop protection. Wonderful we've got again I'm going for the questions from earlier in, the, in your talk we have a question from our Horton Harpist we have two questions from our Horton Harpist who asks uh, can I ask why the uh, climate change, change crisis makes fungi, fungal pathogens spread? Um, and also asks, is there a concern of another pandemic with regards to consuming amphibians? Okay, so the first question is, so, so with, with changes in, in, in temperature due to climate change, then what we will be driving is we will be driving the evolution of fungi that are able to adapt to that temperature to be able to grow in those temperatures. So that will then allow them to grow in, in areas that they perhaps did not grow before. A second part that is alarming with that is that, you know, so one of, one of the greatest defences that, that we as humans, as mammals, have against fungal pathogens is our body temperature. So a body temperature of 37 degrees is non-permissible for the majority of fungi within the fungal kingdom. If we are then generating or allowing fungi to evolve that can actually grow at higher temperatures, then we're running the risk, potentially with Candida auris, that we'll have pathogens can actually then jump into the human host. And that's really something that we cannot afford to happen. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed the second question about the amphibians. It was asking if there's a risk of another outbreak for amphibians or another pandemic. Are there any other fungal diseases that would be on the horizon for amphibians? There is a second um, fungal species that actually is specifically affecting salamanders. Um, so it's related, but it's a distinct fungus from BD. Um, so that is already causing devastation um, in the salamander population. <clears throat> Whether there are any other emerging fungal species, um, I, I think that we're at risk of these all the time. And it's, you know, this is why we have to be so careful, you know, with, with biocontrol strategies, with preventing, you know, um, the sale of, of infected animals. It's just, it's just something that must be stopped. There is some slight good news. And I was, um, I was quite, um, pleased to read this and this is again a study involving Matt Fisher where they've actually been able to contain and 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 well actually to eradicate the island of Mallorca from this BD fungus and um, they've done this using um, disinfectants but also using one of these azole antifungals I think the BD fungus is really sensitive to the azole fungus so uh, to the azole antifungal so a very light dose has actually managed to clear the amphibian population um, of this fungus in Mallorca. It's much harder to do, obviously, when you're dealing with more land-bound um, areas, but yes, that was a heartening story. That, that's some fantastic, fantastic news there. We've got one last question, and I think we'll call it a night there. And it's from Paul Francis, who asks, I understand that our malaria, malaria, our malaria, 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 can uh, generate chemical substances designed to destroy its fungal food competitors underground. Could we learn anything from this? Maybe harness the honey fungus to create substances to kill the fungi that threaten life? You know, I, I honestly think that this is a real untapped area of biology, that we use nature, that have evolved these strategies to allow the competition of, you know, of the organism within its natural habitat. Um, and I, I honestly think that this is, is going to be a really, um, you know, new, exciting area to explore. It's similar to, to the approach that we're using now, where we're actually seeing how bacteria have evolved to kill their fungal competitors, you know. So, yes, I think that this, this is a really good, good point. And thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Um, again, I can I, I give a virtual applause to Janet Quinn for such a wonderful talk. And fantastic, fantastic themes of, you know, so much out there to discover, so much out there to research. Hopefully, as well as being terrified, we're all inspired as well. Um, we'll look to host more of these talks in the future, but other than that, have a good night, everyone.
And thank uh, you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. So nice to see so many friends. <laughs>